Okay, let us slowly begin our class. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, teacher. So we have been reading this first chapter of the Avidamata Sangaha, right? So we have been uh, discussing about the classification of chittas. Do you remember how much you have completed? We have, I think we have completed up to the discussion of uh, all the Kama Vachara Chittas, right? What? Yeah. We have uh, completed our discussion of the Kama Vachara Chittas in three categories, basically. The unwholesome Chittas, right? Chittas rooted in greed, hatred, and delusion. So these are the three um, roots of unwholesome that is you know, mentioned in early Buddhist text and also in the Abhidhamma text. Okay, so um, you can see that all other kinds of negative emotional and psychological aspects come under these three categories, three uh, broad terms, lova, dosa, and moha. And then we discussed the rootless chittas, why they are called rootless? Because they do not have these uh, roots, wholesome or unwholesome roots. Now, what is the difference between an unwholesome chitta and an unwholesome resultant chitta? What is the difference between these two types of chitta? First of all, they are rootless. Secondly, result in itself suggests that uh, they are vipaka chittas. So vipaka means they uh, come to exist or they occur as a result of uh, the actions that are performed earlier, right? So, uh, and these resultant chittas do not um, function as a kamma chitta because they do not have roots. So that means they do not give rise to any other kind of Vipaka later on. And then what is the difference between resultant chittas and functional chittas? Normally, the functional chittas occur um, in the case of enlightened beings, right? 
um yeah this will be more clear later on when we discuss other types of chittas and also especially uh, the you know uh, super mundane chittas and some of the chetasikas because um in the case of the enlightened beings uh, of course these roots are not present and some of the chetasikas are are also not uh, present for example uh, when you talk about chatanahang bikave kammang vadam intention or pollution is kamma so you, to produce a kamma you need to have these roots and also you need to have a certain type of uh, you know other chetasikas being present there whereas in the case of enlightened beings these are not present okay therefore they do not produce um new kamma so old kammas are exhausted new kammas are not produced so but when they function um as an individual with their body speech and mind chittas associated with their actions are considered as <clears throat> functional chittas so today we are going to discuss about uh, rupa vachara chittas and also arupa vachara chittas and then supra mandan chittas hopefully we will be able to complete this section today and then if we have more time we can move to the um, next chapter that focuses on the discussion of chetasika so this is a chart where you can see 52 mental factors chetasika broadly categorized into four categories universals occasionals unwholesome and beautiful but under this categories again you have sub categories right there are for example four universals under unwholesome chetasika and then you have some chetasikas um grouped according to the nature of the chetasikas these are called for example greed group hatred group and there are some different ones again in the section of beautiful chetasikas there are 19 universals abstinences abstinences means those that you need to avoid limitless limitless refers to apamaya boundless or limitless and then wisdom as the 52nd mental factor today i sent you this two list and also the uh, pali text okay so let us begin our uh, discussion on this remaining parts of chittas so yes so so far we have completed our discussion of this 54 chetasikas that come under um, rupa vachara uh, consciousness right now here what you see is uh, how this 54 uh, chittas are classified again i mean you can you know have your own classification if you want to um 
just for your own understanding and clarification if you want to put them in a particular order you can do that i think that is also um, that would be very good for example how many of the chittas are rooted in greed or how many of the chittas are prompted how many of the chittas are uh, you know uh, unprompted and how many are associated with uh, ignorance and how many are associated with you know uh, upekka equanimity so manasa and do manasa right so all these um, different uh, expressions they uh, refer to a certain thing uh, you know uh, in in a particular chitta that we need to uh, keep in mind what does it mean by dittigata uh, sampayutta right so what is the function of ditti there in the chittas that have ditti and what does it mean by dittigata vipayutta why these chittas are called dittigata vipayutta and uh, what exactly you know uh, does it mean by prompted or unprompted and what is the difference between so manasa and do manasa and also upekka with root without root resultant functional so here you see that uh, this is how it is organized again apart from just uh, the chart in the chart it is differently organized right but what you see here eight great wholesome 12 unwholesome 23 resultants so you have resultants in different categories if you look at this chart here now for example you have unwholesome resultant 7 some resultant eight under this category of ahetuka chitta and then again in the next section you have eight chittas that are regarded as resultant so here all the resultant chittas are put together as 23 these are the three categories and then 11 functionals three rootless and eight great functionals by way of feeling as i was saying so manasa do manasa and also um, joy so and equanimity so you have um, yeah especially when we have been discussing this um, rootless chittas there were some chittas that are associated with uh, indriyas and then there are some chittas that occur in a series of a in the series of the cognitive uh, process at different uh, you know points for example sampati chana chitta right that is um, an upekka sahagata chitta, santirana chitta, right? Another moment in the cognitive process. And that is also associated with upekka. But in this list, uh, santirana chitta is associated with so manasa. And so that is how you have um, chittas with joy, with equanimity with uh, displeasure, with pleasure, and with pain. Two chittas, especially 
I think in this category, regarded as uh, painful and joyful. The painful one is the unwholesome. Uh, is it? No. This is, uh, yeah, so, Sukha Sahagatang Kaya Vyanang and Dukkha Sahagatang Kaya Vyanang. Uh, bodily consciousness associated with Dukkha, associated with Sukha. So there is uh, one Sukha. Sorry, one dukkha. So there is difference between uh, pain and displeasure, dukkha and domanasa, pleasure and joy, sukha and somanasa. This is sukha, this is somanasa. Equanimity, upekka. So four different uh, feelings are mentioned here. By way of association with knowledge and views, these are dittigata sampayutta, dittigata vipayutta, and Without this two, neither Dittigata Sampayutta nor Dittigata Vipayutta. By way of prompting. So, this is a different uh, classification. Okay, now uh, let's read this together first. Rupa Vachara Chittani. So, there are 15 altogether. In terms of uh, rupa vachara kusala chitta and then functional and then resultant. Right? Let's read this together and it will be clearer to us. Vitakha vichara piti sukha ekagata sahitang patamajana kusala chitta. Vichara piti sukha ekagata sahitang dutiya jana kusala chitta. Piti Sukha Ekagata Sahitam, Tatiya Jhana Kusala Chittam, Sukha Ekagata Sahitam, Chatutta Jhana Kusala Chittam, Upekha Ekagata Sahitam, Panchama Jhana Kusala Chittam Chati, Imani Panchapi Rupa Vachara, Kusala Chittani Nama. So you have these five uh, rupa vachara kusala chitta. Why they are called rupa vachara kusala chitta? So they are the unique chittas of the rupa realm. Right, but uh, they can be present, or one can develop these chittas in, um, you know, even kama vachara as well. Probably, but I'm not very sure because arupa vacharas uh, are associated with. Arupa Vachara Jana and Arupa Vachara Chitta, right? Mostly in the Kama Vachara, you can give rise to these different other types of Chittas. So this is the translation. Now, what it says here is that in the first Rupa Vachara Chitta, that is associated with the First jhana, that is called first jhana chitta, rupa jhana. In this, you have vitakka, vichara, piti, sukha, ekagata. Five factors present here. So, in English translation, vitakka is translated here as initial application. Normally, vitakka refers to thought. Right? In Pali, Vitaka refers to thought. For example, Kama Vitaka, Avyapada Vitaka, Avihimsa Vitaka, thought of sensuality, 
thought of ill will, thought of cruelty, right? Nekkamma vitakka, thought of renunciation. So vitakka is used in the sense of thought, but here you'd see that all these terms have, um, all these terms have, um, you know, technical meaning. So they should be understood in a specific sense. And it is very important to understand uh, the technical sense of these terms because you do not uh, take them as, uh, you know, general, in the general sense, because so that is not applicable here. And vichara is translated as sustained application. One is initial application, the other is sustained application. Piti is translated as just, sukha, happiness, and ekagata, of course, one-pointedness, right? So five factors are present in the first jhana chitta. First jhana wholesome consciousness. This is kusala chitta. In the second, how many factors are present in the second jhana chitta? Four factors, vichara, piti, sukha, ekagata. So vitakka is absent in the second jhana, right? In the third jhana, three factors are present, piti, sukha, ekagata. So vitakka and vichara both are absent in the third jhana. And then in the fourth jhana, there are two factors that are present. One is Sukha, the other is Ekagata. And in the fifth jhana, Upekha and Ekagata. So two factors are present. So if you notice, you would find here that Ekagata is present in every jhana chitta. And by this, you can understand the importance of Ekagata. It can be that the intensity of ekagata can become stronger and stronger, right? The intensity can become stronger, but it should be present in all the jhana chittas. In fact, whatever meditation practice you carry out, ekagata is one of the most important factors. So what I understand is that uh, when you talk about one pointedness of mind, for example, when you carry out a meditation practice, you are going to have an aramana object of meditation, right? So you have to put all your mental energy to that object. That is called one pointedness of mind, right? Even in your studies, also, general studies, also. Of course, I think probably one cannot have 100% focused mind or attention when doing studies. Probably mind is distracted, right? In various ways. But once your mind is focused on your study, on your reading, on your thinking, whatever you do, you forget about other things. Right, And it seems that uh, this attention or this focused mind is very important in the you know, progress uh, of mental development or in your spiritual practice. Why is that? <laughs> because <clears throat> I think... <clears throat> <clears throat> what is required is two things here. One is um, with this focused mind, you are able to understand the present condition of your being. Right? 
fully and then when you are able to understand the present condition of your being that you know how you are made up of how you are functioning what is going on in your existence right and then with further development of this mental faculty you are able to go beyond that right so if you do not have enough focus enough attention enough mental energy you cannot move forward so mind has to be absolutely focused without distraction that is why you would find that in so many meditation centers in so many buddhist texts all these meditation masters would say that focus on a particular object first the very popular object of meditation normally uh, as it is uh, talked about very often is uh, breath focus on your breath right so it doesn't matter how many times you get distracted but come back to your breath there are 40 meditation objects as uh, as discussed in the visuddhi marga i will come to that later let us first look at this so from 1 to 4 you would find a gradually uh, out of five factors gradually uh, you know one disappears right when you move to second jhana the first of the five factors disappear when you move to the third jhana first two of the five factors disappears until the fourth jhana you have just two sukha and ekagata and when you move to fifth jhana ekagata is present sukha is absent in the place of sukha you have upekha and it seems like even in the arupa jhana these two factors are present upekka and ekagata we will come to that later okay yeah some say that arupa jhana could be um, understood to be a kind of an extension of this fifth jhana because these two factors are present in the arupa jhanas but the object of meditation is different in the rupa jhanas the object of meditation is different types of kasina that have in some way you know uh, form but in the case of arupa jhanas the object of meditation are formless and this next five are rupa vachara vipaka chitta you have the exact same description the only difference is that in a state of kusala chitta kusala chitta these are regarded as vipaka chitta right similarly the next section <coughs> is a presentation of kriya chitta rupa vachara kriya chitta so in the place of vipaka you have the word kriya right so once you are clear about the difference between kusala rupa vachara kusala kusala chitta vipaka chitta and kriya chitta it should be easier to understand let's go to the discussion section why they are called rupa vachara chitta this is where consciousness includes all the chittas which move about in or pertain to the fine material plane of existence because they are associated with or you can say that they are representative of uh, rupa bhumi chittas so that means when you enter into rupa jhanas the kind of chittas that 
you have represent the chittas of uh, rupa bhumi the only difference is that in the rupa bhumi these chittas may be constantly present whereas in the case of um, being in the kama vachara having rupa vachara chittas uh, it means that you are not going to have this chittas continuously it is only when you enter into the jhanas okay when you are not in the jhanas you are not going to have this chittas the realms in which gross matter is absent and only a subtle residue of matter remains rebirth into these realms is achieved by the attainment of the meditative states called jhanas that is understood already high attainments in the development of concentration samadhi so this is very much important um look at the connection between jhanas and samadhi concentration so you have to develop a higher degree of concentration your mind has to be concentrated the states of consciousness which frequent this plane in that they are qualitatively connected to it are called fine material sphere consciousness qualitatively connected to it so the quality the characteristics of rupa jana chittas and the chittas of the rupa bhumi are similar 15 chittas fall into this category as we have seen five wholesome five resultant and five functional the whole sum fine material sphere chittas are experienced by worldlings and trainees who develop the jhanas within this life itself okay so this is clear um their corresponding results arise only in the fine material world in the beings who have been reborn there as a consequence of developing the jhanas so when somebody in this life enters into this jhanas experiences this jhanic chittas and with this jhanic chittas or while in this uh, you know in the jhanas in different jhanas somebody pass away he or she appears in the rupa bhumi and then um, the chittas that they have there is considered as the functional chittas so in this life you have when you develop your rupa jhana you have uh, four some chittas right not the functional chittas in the rupa bhumi you have the functional chittas what about the kriya chittas the five oh, sorry resultant chittas the five functional kriya jhana chittas are experienced only by the arahants who attain the jhanas so once you become an enlightened being an arahant uh after that if you develop the janik chittas that are regarded as kriya chittas they are neither wholesome chittas nor um resultant chittas they are functional chittas the commentators derive the pali word jana from the root uh, from a root meaning to contemplate and again from mm-hmm. another root meaning to burn up so you can see two meanings here one is to contemplate the other is to burn up so i think uh, it is you know you can easily understand what it means by contemplating in the jhana you need to focus your mind and so on so a certain amount of concentration is required right but why burn up what does it mean by burning up
they are called hindrances so as you develop different jhanic chittas you you know um, not exactly overcome you do not overcome completely but uh, subside this nivarana or uh, hindrances are subsided thus the jhanas are so called because they closely contemplate the object and because they burn up the adverse states opposed to concentration the adverse states are the five hindrances of sensual desire ill will sloth and torpor restlessness worry and doubt what are the pali terms for these five nivarana kama chanda right vyapada kama chanda vyapada tina midda udacha kukucha restlessness and worry and vichikicha so these are the five hindrances in many text you have mentioning of this but uh, if you want to find out quickly you can look at this text uh, yana tilak tilokas buddhist dictionary we are talking about nibbana here now Here you have the nirvanas, hindrances. Kama chanda vyapada tina mita udacha kukocha and vichikicha. very beautiful similes presented to explain the functioning of this nibbanas in mind see it says that sensuous desire is compared with water mixed with many fold colors that is the first one kama chanda sensuous desire the mentality having this aspect is um, compared to water mixed with many fold color so when water is mixed with so many different colors what is there in the water it's not clearly seen right ill will with boiling water vyapada vyapada is representative of some kind of anger agitation So it is compared with boiling water sloth and torpor with water covered with moss sloth and torpor refers to laziness okay to carry out the practice uddacha kukacha restlessness and scruples with agitated water whipped by the wind when the water is moved by the wind skeptical doubt with tabit and muddy water which kicha when one's mind is covered with doubt so these are the five hindrances 
The jhanas are attained by the method of meditation called the development of calm or serenity. So the role of samatha bhavana here is to, you know, um, have concentrated mind on account of which you can enter into this jhanas. This type of meditation involves the straightening of the faculty of concentration by fixing the mind upon a single selected object, all mental distraction is eliminated. The hindrances are suppressed and the mind becomes fully absorbed in its object. The development of calm will be dealt with in detail later in a different chapter. The object of jhana consciousness is a mental image called the counterpart sign, Patibhaga Nimitta. This sign is considered a conceptual object, Panyati, but it generally arises on the basis of a visible form. And hence, these jhanas pertain to the fine material sphere. For example, if you have an object of uh, light, right? So light can be taken as an object. Now you can see light with your eyes. When you close your eyes, you visualize that. So your focus is only to that. In the beginning, you look at the light, right? So you have that image in your mind. But when you close your eyes and carry out, carry out your practice, focusing on, the, on that same object of meditation, you have the image of light, right? And gradually it becomes so strong that you just see the light. You do not see any other thing in your mind because your mind is so focused, so concentrated, and that is how you develop your concentration. And even though this image doesn't have any material form because it is derived from the material form, therefore it is called uh, pertaining to the fine material sphere, rupa jhana chittas or rupa vachara chittas. The meditator aspiring to jhana may select as the original object of concentration, a contemplative device called a kasina, such as a colored disc on which attention is fixed. When concentration matures, this physical device will give rise to a visualized replica of itself called the learning sign, ugaha nimitta. And this in turn gives rise to the counterpart sign apprehended as the object of jhana. So the, the first stage is called Uggaha Nimitta, the visual replica, which will then become counterpart sign. Fine material sphere for some consciousness. This category comprises five chittas distinguished by way of the five jhanas, each jhana constituting a distinct type of chitta. The jhanas are enumerated in the order given for two reasons. One, because when one meditates for the attainment of the jhanas, one achieves them in this order, in the order they are presented. And second, because the Buddha taught them in this order. So here the discussion is only in terms of order. First jhana wholesome consciousness, the characteristics of the first jhana chitta here. Each jhana is defined by way of a selection of mental concomitants. Mental concomitants here means uh, chetasika, okay? called its jhana factors, jhana anga. Jhana anga. From among the many mental factors contained in each jhana consciousness, it is this that distinguish the specific jhana from the other jhanas and bring about the process of absorption. So what is the difference between two, two jhana chittas, for example? The difference is basically based on the presence and absence of the jhana factors contained in each uh, type of jhana chittas, right?
The first jhana contains five factors as enumerated in the text. To attain the first jhana, these five factors must all be present in a balanced way. Closely contemplating the object and burning up the five hindrances that obstruct absorption. So these are the factors, right? Vitakka, for example, as we are discussing, generally Vitakka means thought, but in Abhidhamma, it is used in a precise technical sense to mean the mental factor that mounts or directs the mind onto the object. Initial, initial uh, application, as it is translated into English. So when you put your attention towards an object, firmly, that is called vitakka here. It is not a thought, right? The example given here is just as a king's favorite might conduct a villager to the palace, even so vitakka directs the mind onto the object. So you will find a lot of similes like this. So this is uh, to, sh to show a specific function, okay? Carried out by this factor, Vitakka. It directs the mind onto the object. In the practice for attaining Jhana, Vitakka has the special task of inhibiting the hindrance of sloth and torpor. Yeah. So what um, Nivarana hindrance, what hindrance does it counter? sloth and torpor. So you feel lazy or you know you feel what do you say you do not have enough attention and so on. Vitakka is the exact opposite of this laziness right. Uh, it refers to focusing on a certain object. So you take a certain initiative Next is vichara. The word vichara usually means examination. But here it signifies the sustained application of the mind on the object. So this comes immediately after vitakka. So the function of vitakka and vichara is that while vitakka means the initial attention that you put onto the object, Vichara refers to the continuation of that attention. Okay, continuous focus. Sustained application of the mind on the object. Whereas Vitaka is the directing of the mind and its concomitants towards the object. Vichara is the continued exercise of the mind on the object. The commentaries offer various similes to highlight the difference between these two jhana factors. Vitaka is like a bird spreading out its wings to fly. Vichara is like the birds gliding through the air with outstretched wings. So when a bird is flying, first it uh, spreads its wings. So that is compared with Vitaka and Vichara is compared with its actual flying. Vitakka is like a bee's diving towards a flower. Vichara is like the bee's buzzing above the flower. Vitakka is like the hand that holds a tarnished metal dish. Vichara is like the hand that wipes the dish. Vichara in the jhana serve, serves to temporarily inhibit the hindrance of doubt. Temporarily. Okay, not permanently, temporarily, uh, it, you know, uh, counter the hindrance of the <laughs> Right, yes, <laughs> yeah, true. Piti is the next jhana factor derived from the verb Pinayati, meaning to refresh, may be explained as delight or pleasurable. 
interested in the object. The term is often translated as rapture. The rendering which fits its role as a jhana factor, but may, may not be wide enough to cover all its nuances. The com commentators distinguish five grades of piti that arise when developing concentration. So piti is subdivided into five types. Again, minor just, momentary just, showering just, uplifting just, and pervading just. Minor just is able to raise the hairs on the body. Momentary just is like flashes of lightning. Showering just breaks over the body again and again, like waves on the seashore. Uplifting just can cause the body to levitate. And pervading just pervades the whole body as an inundation fills a cavern. The latter is identified as the PT represent in jhana. As a factor of jhana, PT inhibits the hindrance of ill will. So here you have five different types of uh, PT. And uh, these five different types actually, you know, correspond to the kind of, um, uh, how do you say, uh, impact that PT has in your being, right? So when a certain type of PT arises in your mind, in your body, how does it affect to you? For example, it says minor just is able to raise the hairs on the body, right? So you have goosebumps, right? You can feel it. And the other one here, it says momentary just is like flashes of lightning. So that is the kind of experience that you have. And then uh, uplifting zest can cause the body to levitate. So you would feel like you are floating in the air. But here it says that as a jhana factor, it is particularly referring to the fifth type that is you know, that pervades your whole body. And it counters the hindrance of ill will. I think it is quite understandable. When you are joyful, you do not have ill will. Sukha is another jhana factor, pleasant mental feeling. It is identical with somanasa, joy, and not with the sukha of pleasant bodily feeling that accompanies wholesome resultant body consciousness. So when it says sukha here, it should be understood um, in terms of somanasa, because somanasa is more on mental happiness. And sukha, as it is explained here, refers to bodily happiness. So in this case, it is not more on bodily happy feeling, pleasant feeling. It is more on mental feeling. This sukha also renders as bliss, is born of detachment from sensual pleasures. It is therefore explained as niramisa sukha, worldly or spiritual, unworldly or spiritual happiness. It counters the hindrance of restlessness and worry, uddha chakukocha. This is another Nivarana. Though Piti and Sukha are closely connected, they are distinguished in that Piti is a cognitive factor belonging to the aggregate of mental formation, Sankara Khanda, while Sukha is a feeling belonging to the aggregate of feeling, Vedana Khanda. Piti is compared to the delight a very traveler would experience when coming across an oasis. Sukha is the pleasure after bathing and drinking. So even though PT and Sukha seems to be similar in terms of having pleasant and good feeling, it says that uh, PT as a factor, mental factor comes under Sankara Kanda. It is cat categorized as a Sankara Kanda. Whereas sukha, 
in the group of Vedana, Vedana Kanda. Yeah. Delight, rapture. Yes, actually, but um, it seems like that is a subtle difference also between Piti and Sukha. Um, not that these are kusala not akusala yeah somebody enjoying doing um akusala activities is is a akusala akusala chitta akusala actions right and that is mostly associated with wrong view or some other kind of um, unwholesome roots so ekagata is the last of the five factor Ekagata means one pointedness of mind. This mental factor is the primary component in all five jhanas and the essence of concentration. So one should keep this in mind that uh, this is present in all jhanas and also is, it is considered as the essence of concentration. Okay? One pointedness temporarily inhibits sensual desire, a necessary condition for any meditative attainment. Ekagata exercises the function of Closely contemplating the object, the saline characteristic of jhana, but it cannot perform this function alone. It requires the joint action of the other four jhana factors, each performing its own special function. That is vitakka, applying the associated states on the object, vichara, sustaining them there, piti, bringing delight in the object, and sukha, experiencing happiness in the jhana. So this is the explanation of the first jhana where you have these five jhana factors present and subsequently this tells that uh, you know in each different jhana as you proceed on to different jhanas uh, one you know factor out of five gradually uh, is eliminated or reduced. So yes, this passage is important here. Mm. Now in the suttas, you have four rupa jhanas, not five rupa jhanas. In the Abhidhamma, you have five rupa jhanas, right? So what is the difference between these two exposition? The difference between these two expositions is that you have these five factors present in the first jhana, but the second jhana of the sutta exposition is compared to the third jhana of the Abhidhamma exposition. Right? Because Vitaka and Vichara both are absent in the second jhana of the sutta explanation, okay? So therefore you have four jhanas there, but these four jhanas become five in the Abhidhamma because in the Abhidhamma exposition, 
when you proceed into different jhanas just you know out of five one is removed in the second jhana so you have four whereas in the case of sutta in the second jhana you have three factors first two are removed so therefore in the counting in suttas you have four jhanas and in the abhidhamma you have five now talking about concentration because these jhanas develop out of con concentration they are associated with samatha bhavana concentration development um, so it says here that although the suttas do not mention the fivefold analysis of jhana in explicit terms they provide an implicit basis for this analysis in the buddha's distinction between three kinds of concentration so three kinds of concentrations are mentioned here concentration accompanied by both initial application and sustained application this is representative of the first jhana right in the first jhana you have initial application and sustained application so this is one type of concentration concentration without initial application but with sustained application now this is according to abhidhamma this is second jhana in the suttanta you do not have this right and the concentration with neither initial application nor sustained application this one in the suttanta description from second to fourth jhana that means just accept the first first one the other three fall into this category in the abhidhamma presentation third to fifth right last three out of five fall into this category savitakka savichara samadhi now this is representing the first one right avitakka vicharamatta samadhi which is this where vichara is present vitakka is absent that is the second jhana in the avidhamma explanation avitakka avichara samadhi the remaining three so this is how in terms of vitakka and vichara being present or absent samadhi is uh, classified into three the first is obviously the first jhana in both systems and the third is the second and higher jhanas of the suttanta method and the third and higher jhanas of the avidhamma method the second however is now we are clarified within the suttas themselves and only becomes intelligible in the second jhana of the avidhamma method second one is present only in the avidhamma categories so this is how you have okay let's read this verse together panchada jhana bedena rupa vachara mana rupa vachara manasam punyapa punyapaka kriya bheda tang panchada sada bhave fine material sphere consciousness is five fold when divided by way of the jhanas jhana vedena it becomes of 15 times when further divided by way of the whole sum resulted in functional yes so uh, five jhanas become of, of 15 types by occurring as wholesome chitta resultant and functionals each jhana chitta of the same level is defined by the same set of factors whether wholesome resultant or functional all chittas of the fine materials were 
are associated with knowledge yana sampayutta so this is something to keep in mind even though it is not specifically mentioned as a kusala chitta vipaka uh, or uh, kiriya chitta says that all the chittas in this category are associated with knowledge yana sampayutta so knowledge not being a specific jana factor is not mentioned in the formulas yeah so we do not see it mentioning that thus all the fine material sphere chittas have three roots non greed non hatred and non delusion this is clearly understood because these are regarded as kusala chittas right and the result of kusala chittas and uh, the functional ones it should be noted that in contrast with sense sphere wholesome and unwholesome chittas the fine material sphere chittas are not distinguished by way of prompted and un unprompted now yes so this point is mentioned here uh, so there is a question for example that uh, when you talk about some of the chittas you know uh, associated with prompting and some are without prompting in the kama vachara category what about the type of chittas in the rupa vachara category so there are different opinions with regard to this the general opinion is that uh, this characteristics is not applicable to the rupa chittas okay so they occur as a natural process of your you know practice of meditation therefore prompting and unprompting do not apply but uh, uh, there are some abhidhamma teachers they say that you know um, there is a certain function of prompting there and some say that they are not prompted so there are different opinions there this text presents some uh, opinions also the same distinction is also omitted from the exposition of the immaterial sphere and supramundane chittas so this is a general uh, idea with regard to rupa vachara chitta rupa vachara chitta and lokotara chitta that these chittas are not distinguished by way of prompting and unprompting yes yeah but as i am saying that different abhidhamma teachers hold different views we will come to that very quickly here this omission is made because so here it presents the reasoning when one is practicing meditation to attain a jhana a path or a fruit as long as one is dependent upon instigation from others or upon one's own self prompting the mind is not yet in a suitable condition to reach the attainment so what it means is that um, if you still need to decide or if you still need to think about you know carrying out this practice and attaining different jhanas if you need to make decision or if somebody else need to uh, you know um prompt you then it says that um, the condition of your mind is not really then you know suitable to attain this stages because it requires undistracted focused mind so this is one reasoning provided here the distinction of prompted and unprompted is appropriate in relation to the preliminary phase of the practice leading up to the attainment but the chittas with which the actual attainment takes place cannot involve prompting or inducement it may be that when you are engaged in the practice and uh, you have not yet attained any jhana prior to the attainment of any jhana the first jhana for example there may be some kind of prompting but as soon as you enter into the jhanas thereafter the discussion of prompting and unprompting do not occur <coughs> thus in the absence of a 
real possibility of prompted jhana and supramundane attainment, the very distinction between prompted and unprompted becomes untenable in relation to these types of chitras. Yeah. Now here, in the following discussion, it says that uh, a different view is present in a tika called Vibhavani tika. Okay. Since all jhana attainment requires some preliminary exertion, the jhana chittas can never be called unprompted, but only prompted. So this is the conclusion um, presented by this text. Preliminary exertion. So it says that it is like, um, how do you say? Before a bird start to fly, it needs to spread its wings, right? That is the example given, right? So in that you need a preliminary effort, preliminary exertion. And because it is required at the beginning, so the conclusion provided here is that these jhana chittas should be considered as, you know, chittas associated with prompting, not unprompted, okay? This view seems untenable because the preliminary exertion leading up to the jhana should not be identified as a prompting concomitant with the jhana chittas themselves. Now, the next argument that is presented here is that as a factor of jhana, because here the discussion is about the jhana chitta and the factors within the jhana chitta, not something that is prior to the jhana chitta. Okay, so you may need a preliminary exertion, preliminary effort, but as soon as it is a jhana chitta, as soon as it is classified as a jhana chitta, in the jhana chitta, there is no discussion of prompting and unprompting. Rupa jhana. Thus, despite the prestigious authority of the Vibhavani, it still seems preferable to regard the prompted and unprompted distinction as irrelevant to the higher classes of consciousness. Now, these famous uh, Abhidhamma teachers and uh, practitioner, Lady Sayado, he provides uh, you know, further exposition with regard to this. He holds that this distinction may be understood to apply to the jhanas and supramundane states by reason of the distinction made in the text in the mode of progress, Patipada, by which they are gained. So you progress from one jhana to another jhana. So in that context, he said, this prompting and unprompting, this distinction should be understood. And let's see what he has to say here. The Dhamma Sangani distinguishes between attainments gained by difficult progress, Dukkha Patipada, when the defilements can only be suppressed by intense striving and much exertion, and easy progress, Sukha Patipada, when the defilements can be suppressed easily in a pleasant mode. So two ways, uh, you know, this attainment could be achieved. It says that you can follow it, either Dukkha Patipada or Sukha Patipada. In the Dukkha Patipada, it is considered as a difficult progress. Why? Because in that, you need to carry out an intense striving. You need to put so much effort to overcome the defilements. In the Sukha Patipada, you do not need um, so much of effort. You can do that easily. Lady Seado takes the jhana or supramundane chittas 
of one who reaches attainment by difficult progress to be the counterpart of prompted chittas on the sense sphere level, level and the jhana or supramandane chittas of one who proceeds by easy progress to be the counterpart of unprompted chittas so based on this differentiation he says that somebody who make extreme effort you know in his practice to establish concentration and to overcome defilements uh, there is some kind of prompting right in the case of the next type of practice where it is not required everything happens naturally and smoothly that can be regarded as unprompted however while lady sayado's view is noteworthy fact remains that one the dhamma sangani initially classifies the jhana and supramandane chittas without any reference to mode of progress second in the section where it does introduce classification by mode of progress it does not use this distinction as a basis for enumerating distinct types of jhana or supramandane chittas it therefore seems preferable to exclude the prompted and unprompted distinction altogether from the jhana chittas as well as from the path of path and fruition chittas so here uh, the author of this text says that uh, now lady siado's observation is uh, important but if you look at the dhamma sangani exposition you see that when the jhanas are classified into different types um the discussion there is not with regard to the mode of progress it is just for the sake of exposition they are explained probably right and secondly he says that uh, in the section where it does introduce classification by mode of progress in another section when they are discussed in terms of the mode of progress it does not use this distinction the distinction here means um the distinction between two types of you know um practice two types of practice sukha patipada and dukkha patipada so it seems that uh, the author of this text is saying that venerable lady siado's exposition shows that he took uh, in a way he, he understood this two different presentation as one right a slight you know distinction is shown here between these two uh, presentation that in the first the mode of progress is not discussed in the second the mode of progress is discussed and in that this two distinction is not really mentioned therefore um the idea is that the discussion of prompted and unprompted is not really applicable uh, with regard to this type of chittas so with this we end our discussion of uh, rupa vachara chitta i wanted to show you this 40 uh, objects of meditation yes now this is from visuddhi magga meditation objects and types of concentration right so this is a different subject of discussion of course but these are the you know um 40 objects of meditation so you have eight recollections anusati right 
What are the eight recollections? Two eighteen. The eight recollections are the recollection of the Buddha, the recollection of the Dhamma, the recollection of the Sangha, the recollection of virtue, the recollection of generosity. Where are you now? Recollection of gods, recollection of appeasement, and recollection of death. Right? Buddha no sati, Dhamma no sati, Sangha no sati, Sela no sati, Dana no sati, or Chaga no sati, probably. Deva no sati. Appeasement, what is the word for appeasement? I don't remember. And then Maranano Sati. So in the Abhidhamma Sangha also they are mentioned. So this are recollections. The perception of repul repulsiveness in nutriment and determination of the four elements. So these are two. So altogether 10 here. 10 casinos. 19. Yeah, 10 casinos are earth casino, water casino, fire casino, air casino, blue casino, yellow casino, red casino, white casino, space casino, and light casino. Mindfulness of breathing is one. This is Anapanasati. 10 impurities. So these are the 10 impurities. A blotted corpse, discolored crop, corpse, festering corpse, perforated corpse, an eaten corpse, a dismembered corpse, corpse, a slain and dismembered corpse, a bloody corpse, a warm fasted corpse, and a skeleton. And then you have mindfulness occupied with the body, kaya gata sati, and then four immeasurables. You are familiar with these four immeasurables. Loving kindness, natta, compassion, karuna, sympathetic joy, mudita, and equanimity, upekka. And then four formless states. These are specifically for Arupa Jana. Sphere of boundless space, sphere of boundless consciousness, a sphere of nothingness, and a sphere of neither perception nor non-perception. Altogether 40, right? 10 here, 10 plus 10, 20, and then 10 impurity, 30, and this one, 4, 4, 8, 9, 10. 40. Okay, so any questions so far? How many of you would like to make your presentation next week? Buntan, are you ready for presentation? Presentation on your selected topic, topic that you have uh, chosen to write your essay, final essay, assignment topic, yes. Can or not? If you are ready, you can let me know. Right? How long do you want to speak? 50 minutes? Five zero? One five? I see. Okay, let's have a break for 10 minutes. And then we meet again after 10 minutes break.
Okay, let's resume the class. So before going into the discussion of Arupa Avachara Chittas, I'd like to you know, um, mention a few things from Professor Karunadasa's text with regard to the Rupa Vachara Chittas. So these are some important points to be noted. So what he says here is that, yes, we have been talking about Nivarana. Um, you do not eliminate the Nivaranas. So it is important to note that you do not eliminate them yet. You just suppress them. <clears throat> okay, so it says here the jhana concentration needs to be preceded at least by a temporary suspension of five mental impediments. Temporary suspension. That means they are not on the surface, they are not active. Okay, so they are suspended for a time as long as you are in jhana. When they are present, they are active. You are not in jhana. Right? Because they are exactly opposite of jhananga. Yeah, so and um, with regard to the fifth jhana especially, because once you enter into the first jhana, you proceed gradually until the fifth jhana, right? In the Rupa Vachara uh, category. So it says here, the net result of the successive elimination of jhana factors is that ekagata, one-pointedness of the mind, gets more and more intensified until it reaches the highest point of intensity in the fifth jhana. This is very important because when you look at the list of different jhana chittas, gradually different jhana factors are eliminated. What remains is only ekagata. And finally, in the fifth jhana, you have upekka also. Upekka, upekka. Fifth one is, is, is uh, having upekka together with ekagata. So the importance of ekagata is, you know, um, very clear here. It says that as you proceed towards different jhanas, Ekagata becomes more finer and finer. It gets intensified until it reaches the highest point of intensity in the fifth jhana. And these two factors are present even in the Arupa jhanas as well. But as a further note, you can find here that of the five jhanas, it is the fifth that is characterized by the supreme perfection of equanimity and mindfulness. <clears throat> the supreme perfection of equanimity and mindfulness. It is the foundation jhana, padaka jhana, for the realization of the six kinds of higher knowledge. Chalavinya. These are psychokinesis, Iddivida, clear audience, Dibbasota, telepathic knowledge, Chatopariyayana, retrocognitive knowledge of past existence, Ubenivasanu Satyana, knowledge of the 
disease and survival of beings, Chutu Papatayana, and the knowledge of the destruction of defiling impulses, Asavakayayana. Out of these six higher knowledges, first five, you know, belong to the mundane category in the sense that you may develop these five abhinyas, higher knowledges, without attaining arahanthut. Whereas asavakayayana, the sixth one, is fundamental for the attainment of arahanthut. Uh, defiling asava asava uh, is rendered as defiling impulses in english here asava means cankers different types of defilements negative energies yeah kama asava bhava asava Ditta asava, avijja asava, normally four types of asavas are discussed. In a way, actually, among all these technical terms representing negative emotional and psychological aspects, such as asava as defilements, nivarana, hindrances, anusaya, latent tendencies, sangyojana. What is the English word for sangyojana? Fetter thing is, yeah, fetters. So these are different presentation of same things. Different presentations. Yes. So now we are going to look at the Arupa Jana Chittas. Only? Yes, yes. But I think, uh, you know, not just suppressing, I think probably we have to understand it in the sense that uh, they are not completely eradicated. It can be that some of these uh, defilements are weakened. You see, temporarily suppressed, we can, you know, uh, but not eradicated completely. Yeah, so Asabakaya. Uh, yana cannot be obtained through jhana alone, through samadhi alone. So you need to have the practice of insight. It requires wisdom, presence of wisdom. And the function, function of wisdom is to see things as they are. 
in terms of anicca, dukkha, and anatta with regard to the five aggregates. Right? So that is represented as seeing things as they are. Then only you have asavakaya yana. Only the arahants are free from the asavas. Otherwise, as a practitioner, you can develop all these jhanas without becoming arahant. In fact, this establishment of, you know, uh, establishment in the jhanas, in different jhanas are actually not really required to obtain uh, arahant food. Also, it is not uh, unique to Buddhism, unique to Buddha's teaching. This development of jhanas, rupa jhanas, arupa jhanas, not unique to Buddha sasana. In other religious system, they also have different practices leading to the development of jhanas. Chanichittas. Yeah. Yes. If you three knowledge. Those are in terms of uh, having these higher knowledges only. When you develop the Janic mind and then you also destroy the Asavas and become an Arahant, that means you are a Chalabi Arahant, right? So that means that you are an Arahant with all these higher knowledges. But if you are not developing Janik Chittas and becoming an Arahant just by eradicating the departments, that means you do not have this higher knowledge. I think Pubbe Nivasano Sati and Chutupapatayana are basically probably, um, most, in most cases, they are probably present. And in some cases, probably not present even. Yes, so now let's look at the description of Arupa Vachara Chitta. So there are four Arupa Vachara Kusala Chitta, four Vipaka Chitta, and four. Kiriya Chitta, all together you have 12. Let's read this together. Akasanan Chayatana Kusala Chitta, Vinyanan Chayatana Kusala Chitta, Akin Chanyayatana Kusala Chitta, Neva Sanya Asanyayatana Kusala Chitta Chati, Imani Chattari Pi Arupavachara Kusala Chitta Ni Nama. So, Akasa um, Nanchayatana, infinite space. Ayatana means the sphere, a base of infinite space. <coughs> the sphere of infinite consciousness, the sphere of nothingness, and the sphere of neither perception nor non-perception. The object of this meditation is different. For the first one, the object is, um, object can be the same as the object of fifth Rupa Jhana. Right, so from that, so this is, this is a kind of a, 
how do you say, um, necessary development after the Rupa Janas. If you do not develop Rupa Janas, you are not going to develop Arupa Janas. Okay, so this development of Arupa Janas come after one experiences the Rupa Janas. So after you complete your attainment of fifth Rupa Jana, then only you are able to develop the first Arupa Jana. Similarly, Habibaka Chitta and Kriya Chitta. Yeah, so as it says here, um, matter has been totally transcended and only consciousness and mental factors remain. Rebirth into these four realms comes about through the attainment of the Arupa Janas. This is clear. The four immaterial or formless absorptions which are raised by developing concentration beyond the five jhanas of the fine material sphere. So while you are developing your Arupa Janas after, after you know you are established in the Arupa Janas, you can do that in this lifetime. That is regarded as Kusala Arupa, uh, Arupa Vachara Kusala Chitta. And the Vipaka Chitta refers to the chittas that you have when you are reborn in the Arupa Loka due to your establishment of Rupa, Arupa Jana Chittas in this life, right? And the Kiriya Chittas refers to the Chittas that uh, enlightened beings, Arahans, Buddhas, they possess when they are in these Janas. Akasanan Chayatana, the first of the four immaterial jhanas is attainment of the base of infinity space. To reach this, a meditator who has mastered the fifth fine material jhana based on a Kasina object spreads out the counterpart sign of the Kasina until it becomes immeasurable in extent. You see, so it is necessarily developed from the final Rupa Jhana Chittas. Then he removes the kasina by attending only to the space it pervaded. <clears throat> Two things happen. One is there is a shift from rupa vachara chitta to arupa vachara chitta. The object of meditation in the final rupa vachara jhana chitta remains the same when you are having this shift into the arupa vachara jana chitta but gradually the kasina as an object of meditation is no more there only the space that it pervaded so therefore you contemplate on the infinite space. So this is the second step that, uh, you know, that is taken place. Through repeated attention given in this way, there eventually arises in absorption a chitta having as object the concept of infinite space. The expression base of infinity infinity space, strictly speaking, refers to the concept of infinity space, which serves as the object of the first immaterial sphere consciousness. Here the word ayatana has the sense of a habitat or dwelling for, a, for the chitta of the jhana. However, in a derivative sense, the expression base of infinity space is also extended to the jhana itself. So this is uh, associated to the concept, to a concept of infinity of space. And from the first Arupa Jhana to second Arupa Jhana, when you move forward, 
you have initially you have the objective meditation as infinite space until it changes to infinity of consciousness infinite consciousness similarly from infinite consciousness to nothingness and the following one so uh, yeah look at this chart and becomes clear so these are the four um, arupa jana chittas right direct object transcendent object two ways these are presented or some chitta resultant chitta functional chitta concept of space is the direct object here but the object of meditation that you overcome is the concept of kasina so this is from the fifth rupa jana right similarly the direct object of this meditation is consciousness of infinite space <laughs> you transcend the concept of space then you have this consciousness of infinite space therefore a sphere of infinite consciousness this way should be understood this way okay again here in the third arupa chitta arupa jana chitta you transcend the consciousness of infinite space concept of non existence becomes your direct object and therefore it is called a sphere of nothingness when you are you are established there and then finally you transcend the concept of non existence direct object of your meditation becomes consciousness of nothingness and therefore you have a sphere of neither perception nor non perception so this are regarded as two alambana one is the object to be directly apprehended by the chitta alambitabba the other is the object to be transcended atikkamitabba so there is a difference between the exposition with regard to rupa janas and arupa janas what happens in the rupa jana chittas is that you develop a certain chananga jana factors and then gradually as you progress um, some chanangas are, are you know removed right until you have just upekka Uh, ekagata together with upekka in this also you have this two janangas present but in terms of meditation object two types of object are present in every uh, in the development of every arupa jana chitta one that you transcend the other that you apprehend or or develop the arupa janas differ from the rupa janas in several important respects while they are rupa janas can take various objects such as the different kasinas etc each arupa jana apprehends just one object specific to itself also the rupa janas differ from each other with respect to their jana factors the first having five factors second four etc the meditator who wishes to attain the higher jhanas keeps the same object and eliminates each successively subtle factor until he reaches the fifth jhana but to progress from the fifth rupa jhana to the first arupa jhana and from one arupa jhana to the next there are no more jhana factors to be transcended in a state the meditator progresses by transcending each successively subtler object 
the chittas of the arupa jhanas all have the same two jhana factors what are the two jhana factors upekha and ekagata are the jhana factors these are objects different namely equanimity and one pointedness for this reason the four arupa jhanas are sometimes spoken of as being included in the fifth rupa jhana we have discussed it earlier right yeah kind of an extension to that fifth rupa jhana also as chittas they are different because they pertain to a different sphere and have different types of objects than the fifth jhana but because as jhanas they are constituted by the same two jhana factors they are sometimes considered by the teachers of avidhamma as modes of the fifth jhana so this is only in terms of these two jhana factors being present in arupa jhana chittas that they are sometimes regarded as an extension or extended exposition of uh, fifth jhana chitta but because the objects of this jhana chittas are different they are formless they are categorized as arupa jhana chittas collectively the 15 fine material sphere chittas and the 12 immaterial sphere chittas are designed so designated as mahagata chitta sublime or lofty so this two types of chittas two categories of chittas are regarded as exalted or sublime consciousness higher consciousness okay? supreme consciousness because they are free from the hindrances and are pure elevated great states of mind you see the word used here is free from the hindrances they are not eradicated completely but when you are in jhana factors they are not present when you are in the in the uh, jhana states jhanic states they are not present all the 81 types of consciousness discussed so far are termed lokya chitta mundane consciousness because they pertain to the three worlds the sensuous world kama loka fine material world rupa loka and immaterial world arupa loka so the the exposition of this arupa jhana chitta are not so much right and this is the last category in the discussion of types of chittas any questions so far that is an interesting point actually but i think that should be understood in different uh, context so one point is that as we have been discussing um a particular bhumi is uh, is understood in the sense that the type of consciousness that is representative of that bhumi becomes the you know frequent uh, consciousness but it does not mean that that is the type of consciousness that is present all the time 
so this is one point and when you understand it in this way that means there is a possibility that the type of consciousness that you are having right now because you belong to a particular bumi does not mean that you are going to have it throughout your existence in that boom. That means there is a possibility that you are going to have uh, differences of chittas. Right? So what it means is that uh, as we have been discussing, when you enter into the jhanas, these hindrances are subsided, they are not present. But when you are not in the jhanas, they are present. In the Rupa Loka, Arupa Loka, probably, um, when you are, I don't know, probably as long as they represent functional chittas, you are not supposed to have this nevaranas present, right? But I'm not sure if you are going to have only functional siddhas. This is, I know, this is one thing that comes to my mind. The other is that when you say that uh, when you are in jhanas, these nivaranas are not present, it does not mean that they are completely absent. Right? So there are different layers of uh, consciousness in the stream of consciousness, right? So probably from that perspective also there can be some discussion. But I did not really think about it you know, very seriously, but that is an important point. And uh, the last statement that we read here, anyway, these chittas belonging to Rupa Loka, Arupa Loka, all these are Lokya chittas, as opposed to Lokottara chittas. And Lokya chittas are connected to I mean, they, they, they come under the expression samsara, right? So that means there are some fundamental uh, fundamental fundamental, you know, um, mistake or, you know, how do you say problems are still there, the underlying thought of identity, self-view, right? Mana, as you are saying, these are there. It can be that sometimes probably they are not so active. Sometimes they are very active. <laughs> hmm? Transgression? Yeah. Yes, of course. <laughs> hmm. <laughs>
No, no, no. Uh, it is only when you, as long as you develop this Chanic mind, you are in jhana. Otherwise, you are not in jhana. You are, um, you know, in a different, with different uh, chittas. But in those bhumis, rupa bhumi and arupa bhumi, they are supposed to be with this mind all the time. But as a human being, if you are developing this chittas, it is only as long as you develop, you are in that, you know, uh, jhanic mind, otherwise you are not in jhan. Yeah, so I don't think even those enlightened beings, arahants and so on, uh, those who, you know, um, can develop jhanic chittas, jhanic mind. They are also, I don't think they are always going to be in jhana all the time. So, but it seems that from different discussions and, and text, um, we come to know that, uh, you know, this, um, Entering into the jhanas and dwelling in the jhanas, time to time, you know, um, helps these beings to regain energy, for example, you know, so they relax when they are exhausted. In the case of Buddha and different arahants, because they have been always moving from place to place, giving teaching and so on. So every day for some times they enter into meditation, into absorption, right? It is like uh, for the common people, we go to sleep. So when we go to sleep, we do not do anything. We are unaware of the, uh, you know, active world, right? And why do you sleep? Because you are exhausted and you need energy to work next day, right? You gain your energy. If you have a good sleep, you feel refreshing. But in the case of these uh, practitioners, the sleep is, I think, la less. What they do is, you know, they enter into this meditative stage where they relax completely because they are filled with joy, right? They are filled with rapture, joy, relaxation. But they are not, you know, they do not stay in these states all the time. That is for sure. But I think you can explore into that. You can look at some text. You know, uh, the chittas of the beings in the Rupa Loka and Arupa Loka, how do they function? How do they change in relation to the Rupa Jana Chittas and Arupa Jana Chittas? Are they exactly the same or different? If they are same, to what extent they are same? If they are different, to what extent they are different? In what respect? That would be an interesting topic of discussion, I think. Maga and Pala as Maga and Pala we come to. Yeah, so we can see it here, we will uh, discuss this now. There was a question with regard to that also. Somebody raised a question, Panasiri. One one enters to Sota Pati, he got Maga Chitta. Therefore, what is Pala Chitta? It is same Chitta. Maga Chitta and Pala Chitta are different. And therefore, they are called differently, right? So 
when you are in the marga i think there are some descriptions later on we will come to that uh, discussion with regard to how many moments you remain in the marga chitta and how many moments in the pala chitta it seems that when you are in the lokatra in the development of lokatra chitta in this sphere this is now we are talking about arya pugala so you have transcended your lokiya uh, chittas right you became an arya now so you entered into the sphere of noble being in a way you have overcome this samsaric existence to some extent even though you are in samsara with this body and mind right so sota patti means you already entered into this stream already you entered into this stream now what is required is the progression you will progress once you have this taste of freedom once you enter into the path necessarily you will be progressing you are not going to come back okay so that is the idea now magga chitta it says that i think magga chitta just one moment and immediately after that you have phala chitta and phala chitta can last for several moments right and this is how it is explained and also um, with regard to this uh, lokatara chitta so also i think just as the rupa jana chitta and arpa jana chitta it seems that of course you have a deeper understanding of truth and therefore you are a noble being but it seems that uh, you know you do not always have this chittas we will come to that later on it seems that you can have them every time you want but probably you do not have them all the time okay yes, that we are going to explore now yeah let's see so these are the lokatara chittas right now you have eight lokatara chittas in terms of magga and phala okay let's read it together sotapatti magga chittam sakatagami magga chittam anagami magga chittam arahatta magga chittam jati imani chattaripi lokottara kusala chittani nama sotapatti phala chittam sakatagami phala chittam anagami phala chittam arahatta phala chittam chati imani chattaripi lokottara vipaka chittani nama ichevan sabata api ata lokottara kusala vipaka chittani samatani so a chittas four magga four phala supra mundane consciousness is consciousness that pertains to the process of transcending the world transcending what world consisting of five aggregates of clinging you have the five aggregates what you overcome is this clinging you do not have the clinging right yeah so that is clear here this type of consciousness leads to liberation from samsara the cycle of birth and death and to the attainment of nirvana the cessation of suffering there are eight supramandian chittas these pertain to the four stages of enlightenment stream entry one stage turning non returning and anship each stage involves two types of chitta magga chitta and phala chitta all supramandian chittas take as object the um unconditional reality nibbana so this is unique to this type of chittas that the object of meditation here is nibbana but they differ as paths and fruits according to their functions path consciousness has the function of eradicating of permanent or permanently attenuating defilements attenuating means making the defilements weak very weak the fruition consciousness has the function of experiencing the degree of liberation made possible by the corresponding path so this is related in the magga consciousness what you do is that by following a certain practice you eradicate gradually different types of defilements or you make them very very weak now in this in relation to this 
four uh, Lokottara chittas, there is a discussion of Sanyojana. Fetters, ten fetters. Right? So, for example, when you enter into stream entry and you become a Sotapanna, you eradicate first three. And then when you enter into the second one, Sakatagami, you, after eradicating these three, you make the following two weak. When you attain to this third one, Anagami, you eradicate the first five. And then when you become an Arahant, you eradicate the last five as well. So all the 10 fetters are removed. So what happens is that once it is like, uh, once your mind is free from, um, negative psychological emo and emotional aspects completely, then it is filled with um, complete, you know, uh, beautiful mental states, okay, mental factors, right? So when the factors that contribute to suffering are removed. You have the presence of happiness, right? Yes. So as it says here, the path consciousness has the function of eradicating or permanently attenuating defilements. Okay, you eradicate, then what happens? The fruition consciousness has the function of experiencing the degree of liberation made possible by the corresponding path. Degree of liberation. So you experience a certain type of vimutti, freedom. The path consciousness is a kusala chitta, a wholesome state. The fruition consciousness is a vipaka chitta. Each path consciousness arises only once. See here? and endures only for one mind moment. Now here, it is talking about the path consciousness, Magga Chitta. It is never repeated in the mental continuum of the person who attains it. You do not remain within the Magga Chitta for several mind moments. Just one mind moment. The corresponding fruition consciousness initially arises immediately after the path mo moment and endures for two or three mind moments. Subsequently, it can be repeated and with practice can be made to endure for many mind moments in the supramundane absorption called fruition attainment, phala samapatti. So the next part here says that with repeated practice, the endurance of uh, this type of chittas can be longer, right? Last longer. With repeated practice. So what it means is that You are not always in the same same state of mind. Because it doesn't sustain. It requires repeated practice. The paths and fruits are attained by the method of meditation called the development of insight. So here you have the discussion of Vipassana Bhavana. What is the characteristics of this meditation? This type of meditation involves the straightening of the faculty of wisdom. So here the focus is not ekagata. You see, earlier we have been talking about the ultimate you know, development, the final development of ekagata, one-pointedness of mind. Here the focus is <laughs> sharpening uh, the wisdom faculty. 
by sustained attention to the changing phenomena of mind and matter. Sustained attention. To achieve the sustained attention, you need to develop concentration. That is what it means. But you do not have to develop jhanic mind. That is not required. But you need a focused mind, right? To observe what? To observe the changing phenomena of mind and matter, that is your five aggregates, the meditator learns to discern the true, their true characteristics of anicca, dukkha, and anatta. So, so far we have been, I mean, normally, generally, we have been talking about these three characteristics, universal characteristics of existence, conceptually. So we have some degree of conceptual understanding that, you know, things are impermanent. They produce suffering because there is no self, right? Here, what happens is that there is a true, actual realization, a comprehension of this. It is no more a conceptual understanding. It is a real experience. When these insights gain full maturity, they issue in the supramundane paths and fruits. Oh, already 11 o'clock. Okay, I think uh, probably we cannot proceed further. Uh, we have already come to the end of the discussion of uh, the types of chittas, right? And these are not really very difficult. I think you can go through this. Uh, once you finish this, we can move uh, you know, to the next chapter very quickly. In fact, I think that if you go through these last few pages, it should be very clear to you with the, the kind of discussion that we have been having in past few classes. I do not have to read everything in detail, right? This is just a further exposition from here, how this H it has become uh, 40, right? Because, you know, when they are associated with uh, Chana Chittas, Chanic factors. So this is not very complex. And this is just summary. Just these two pages you have to look at. One is this path of stream entry, why it is the path of, path of stream entry. And some examples are given because you enter into the path and it says that you really, you know, you are really established in the noble and full path. So therefore it is called that you entered into the path. And these following discussions are presented in relation to Sanyo Jana only. Yeah. So I would ask you to go through these two pages and have your own understanding. From next class, we will directly focus on the next chapter, Jata Sika. Okay. Any question? So these are the 10 fetters. So you have 10 fetters. Sakaya Ditti Vichikicca, Silabhata Paramasa, Kamaraga, Vyapada, Ruparaga, Aruparaga, Mana, Udacha, and Avijja. So when you become a Sotapanna, you eradicate these three, you completely destroy these three. When you become Sakatagami, you uh, make these two weak. And then when you attain Anagami, all these vibes are removed. And when you become an Arahant, even these remaining five are also removed. So that is how it is. Uh, presented in the next two pages, that's all.
Okay. Any question or remark? If there is no question or remark, we can end our class here, right? Okay. Thank you for joining the class. See you next week. Thank you, Josie, next week. Thank you so much. See you, teacher.